Hi. Uh, so my talk is uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective Jenkins Users. Uh, don't know why I did two slides there. Um, who am I? Uh, I'm the Build and Tools Architect at Cloudera um, in California. I'm a contributor to Jenkins Core and author and committer to a number of plugins since the spring of 2009, uh, which is actually kind of terrifying when I think about it. Uh, I'm a committer and PMC member of a number of Apache projects uh, and an ASF member and volunteer uh, maintaining the Jenkins instance at builds.apache.org. Um, This talk is about Jenkins best practices based on my experiences. Uh, I gave a version of this talk uh, two and a half years ago at OzCon in uh, Portland, Oregon. And, and then I forgot about it. But then I realized I was getting emails from SlideShare every couple weeks, and it just kept getting more and more and more hits. And so eventually I realized that if people were still looking at this talk and still trying to find some value from it, I should probably update it, because two and a half years is a long time in Jenkins. So these are the lessons that I've learned from maintaining multiple large Jenkins instances over the years. Um, for example, Cloudera has three masters, each of which have over 1,000 jobs, and I'm running dozens of uh, long-running jobs at a time. There's also lessons from working on builds.apache.org which also has over 1,000 jobs, uh, over half of them being uh, Maven job types, uh, with more limited hardware, and with over 100 different project teams. So it's not like uh, a unified environment by any stretch of the imagination. Then there's the lessons just from my time on IRC, working on core, working on plugins, etc. Your mileage may vary. These, these habits, I think, can be useful on pretty much every Jenkins instance, but how useful they'll be is going to vary depending on your size. A lot of the particular problems that I talk about are ones that show up much more at scale. But like I said, I think that you can find some real value even on a smaller scale setup. Uh, but these are also my recommendations. They're not necessarily the only thing you should do. They're opinionated. They're based on my experiences. You need to learn what's best for your Jenkins setup based on your experiences and your needs. So the first habit is to make your master stable and restorable. The first thing to do uh, to make your master stable is to use LTSs. Uh, the LTS releases are, by definition, more stable and more reliable than the Bleeding Edge weekly releases. I mean, we love it when people use the Bleeding Edge weekly releases because then we get lots of bug reports, and those are useful. But if you're trying to actually run in production, you don't really want to run buggy software. As Kolske mentioned in uh, his talk, the LTS release trains are created every 12 weeks. Uh, the active train gets updated three times before the next one starts. There's that heavy automated acceptance testing and uh, manual testing before they go out. So it's, there's a lot more QA going into the LTS releases than there is to the bleeding edge releases. So that, that one, I think at this point, uh, two and a half years ago, that seemed like a new thing. Now I think we've all pretty much gotten to know the value of the LTS releases. But just as you need to be conservative about upgrading your master, you need to be conservative about upgrading your plugins. Uh, plugins can change a lot without it being obvious to a user. Uh, backwards compatibility can and does sometimes break. Uh, for example, the extended email plugin uh, had a new release uh, within the last few months that drastically changed how it stored and configured recipient or trigger settings. And as a result, on our setup at Cloudera, we lost all of our uh, rather specific customizations for uh, the triggers so that suddenly it went from how we'd configured it to send on certain builds to certain groups, certain you know, uh, scenarios, to just sending everything to everybody on every failure only. That 
was, oh, including uh, everyone who'd made a commit, which wasn't great when we were building upstream Apache projects internally. Um, people don't really like it when suddenly they get build email from Cloudera saying that we broke a dupe. Um, yeah. Uh, and in addition to backwards compatibility problems, new features can be unstable or problematic in the wild. Uh, so conservatism there is a good thing. It'll make your, your, test, your environment more reliable, more repeatable, more consistent. I highly recommend having an upgrade test bed. Uh, if we'd had a better one uh, before that uh, email publisher uh, plugin upgrade, we would have caught that it kind of messed up everything. You want to test out your upgrades and your new plugins in that test bed environment before you go live in production. Uh, Jenkins is, in many cases, part of your production workflow, and you need to treat it like that. Set up some sample jobs that will cover your plugin usage to make sure that uh, you're not going to break some essential part of your workflow with a new version of the plugin. If it's possible, test your usage at scale, because there are a number of things that will crop up in Jenkins that only show up at scale. <coughs> and give the significant changes, like uh, an upgrade to a new version of the core or changes to something like the Git plugin, Give it a few days on the test bed before you take it to live. Make sure there's no creeping little things that will add up over time. Yeah, you should back up your Jenkins configuration. Um, again, something that seems pretty self-evident at this point, but not something that there's one single obvious solution for. Uh, within Jenkins itself, I like the thin backup plugin. It's got some problems, like pretty much every plugin. Uh, it, by default, tries to take Jenkins offline to do its backup, which isn't really necessary most of the time. But it seems to do a better job at knowing what it should and shouldn't backup than some of the other plugins I've seen. You can also do full copies of Jenkins Home. Since everything is just serialized to disk, you just copy the disk. But if you've got a lot of build logs, if you've got a lot of archived files, that can take a long time and use a lot of disk. You can also just copy certain files that you care about. Uh, there's a, a link that you can see once this is up on SlideShare to a shell script that I hacked together that rsyncs just the files that I know I care about uh, and then backs them up in a Git repo. Uh, so th there's a lot of different options. The important thing is just that you do something to back up your Jenkins configuration so that you're not hosed if your machine dies. <laughs> and lastly, and this habit is something that may be a little controversial. Um, I really don't like the Maven job type. Um, I don't mean that I don't like Maven. I actually really like Maven. But the Maven project type, uh, is problematic. Uh, its implementation is such that it creates a whole lot of different uh, additional objects and inheritance from the abstract project and all kinds of things so that lazy loading, plugins, uh, and the like can do some strange behavior, especially at scale, because it's overdoing things. It's doing things more than you'd expect it to do. So if you don't need it, I'd recommend you don't use it. It's handy, but you can do everything you really need to in uh, the freestyle projects with Maven build steps just as uh, practically. And then you avoid some weird edge cases. The second habit is to break up the bloat. Uh, now, what do I mean by that? A few things. First, multiple masters. Uh, scale horizontally, not vertically. Um, if you have a lot of projects and a lot of teams, it makes a lot more sense to have multiple masters grouped by team or by project or by role than it does to have one giant master that's running all of your builds. Um, it makes it a lot easier to restart when you need to install a, a custom plugin or upgrade any plugin or anything like that. <coughs> 
because you're not going to be disrupting your entire user base, just one set. Um, I've also seen some improved performance uh, if you're running, say, three masters with 500 jobs each on even at all on the same host than if you're running one master with 1,500 jobs. There just seem to be some performance improvements in, uh, when you've got a smaller set per uh, master. And again, the bigger you go, the more likely you're going to hit strange edge cases. Uh, so if you can keep your masters relatively small in the term of the number of jobs and the number of slaves, you're going to have more reliability. Uh, break up your jobs. Uh, monolithic jobs seem simple at first. Uh, you just put everything you're doing in one job. But as has been demonstrated uh, many times in, well, last presentation, presentation over on the other side, in Kosuke's presentation, and probably in five or six more presentations today, you can get a lot of uh, value out of modularization and reuse. Um, if you've got multiple jobs uh, to do your workflows, you're able to take advantage of things like generic jobs that are used, uh, say, for every release, you can always have one common step where you can specify different parameters that go into it and not have to create five different copies of one job for five different releases. So it can just make your number of jobs simpler, your maintenance of those jobs simpler, et cetera. And there are not many things that are more frustrating than a 10-hour build that crashes nine and a half hours in. And that happens. Uh, with a, a multi-job workflow that's designed properly to be aware of that kind of situation, you can relaunch it from where it uh, crashed out and complete it without having to restart from the beginning. Again, like Koske said in, uh, the, when talking about the workflow plugin, I've, I've found that that's immensely useful when you've got a really big, really complicated uh, set of tasks to run. <laughs> there are a bunch of tools to uh, break up your jobs, to uh, set up that kind of workflow. I tend to use the parameterized trigger plugin and the conditional build step plugin. Um, you can easily move in the copy artifact or promoted builds plugins uh, into that same kind of workflow. They're very powerful. There's pretty much nothing you can't do uh, with that that you could do with any of the other plugins in terms of f raw functionality, but they're not very user friendly. Uh, they're not as easy to configure. Um, so if you're a Jenkins Power user, they're great, but if you're trying to set up something for your users to be able to set up their build workflows, may not be the best idea. Uh, the build pipeline plugin, which I believe was mentioned in the last talk here, uh, can visualize your workflow, can have manual steps along the way, and that's pretty nice. And then, of course, there's the workflow plugin that uh, Koske mentioned, uh, and I have not yet played with it, but it looks very interesting. Uh, the third habit is to automate Jenkins tasks. Be lazy. Um, they, if you're not lazy, you're not doing your job right. Don't do things by hand if you don't have to. Uh, with the script console and uh, the scriptler plugin, you're able to get deep into the Jenkins internals. You're able to actually control the object model, get full visibility of everything that's going on, and drastically alter things on the fly. Uh, so you can make bulk changes to jobs, search for configurations that you know you're, you don't really want people to be setting up, like when I had to fix all of our uh, extended email configurations because they broke. Uh, it was easier for me to do this through the script console than it would have been for me to do it by hand. <laughs> and with Scribbler, you're able to store and share these Groovy scripts uh, for reuse by yourself or uh, by publishing them to the Scriptler catalogs that are publicly available so they can be reused by others. So it's a nice step in between plugins and doing it by hand. Some examples of the kinds of things that you can do with the Script Console and Scriptler, uh, 
that I found in the scriptural catalogs and in some cases use. Uh, you can disable and enable jobs that are matching a, a pattern. I use that when we finish a release of CDH at Cloudera to disable the 45 or 50 jobs that are associated with that release because I don't really need them to build anymore, but I want to keep them around for historic reasons for at least a while. You can clear the build queue, which is handy when a job goes completely insane and decides to spawn 400 other uh, builds. Uh, you can tweak the log rotation or discard all build settings across all your jobs, which is great because users will often not set that up. And if you're a Jenkins admin and you don't have unlimited disk space, you kind of want builds to go away eventually. You could do things like disabling SCM polling at night across all your jobs, or reconfigure them all to use uh, uh, the optional uh, H pattern so that you can uh, have them properly uh, staggered across an hour range or time range rather than having a thundering herd of everything polling at the same time. And one of my favorites, and one that seems really simple but is incredibly useful, is you can actually run the log rotator, actually discard old builds without having to kick off builds of everything. So that when you go change those... <laughs> All right then. Uh, <laughs> no more hands in my pockets. Yeah, so you can discard builds, which is really good. Um, because otherwise, the builds stick around. Uh, yeah, OK. Uh, so you can also run these kinds of scripts as part of your build. Uh, the Groovy plugin uh, lets you run an arbitrary set of Groovy code uh, with its normal Groovy step, which is great. But with the system Groovy step, you're able to actually run uh, within the Jenkins JVM. Uh, the master's JVM and be it, or actually I think you can also do it in the slave's JVM. And then you can get full access to Jenkins during your build process. Um, that can be risky because you are giving your build process full access to Jenkins. Um, so you don't want to overuse this. You may be careful about who you want to give uh, permission to do this kind of job. But it's a great way to pilot plugin concepts, to try something out without having to go through the full plugin development process and see, OK, does this actually work? Does this make sense in my workflow? Or it may just be something that isn't actually big enough to be worth a plugin on its own. Um, there's a lot of, uh, like, if you want to have something that will uh, automatically update the keep forever status of jobs based on some criteria. Uh, that may be not actually in-depth enough or reusable enough outside of your use cases to be worth writing a full plugin, but it still can be useful. With system groovy steps, you're able to do that kind of thing. You can also run scriptler scripts as build steps so that you can have that reuse of the scripts across multiple jobs and the like. So I find that to be a really powerful tool. You don't want to use it excessively, but in certain contexts, it gives you a lot more control uh, of the Jenkins internals from within your builds. Uh, and as has been mentioned in uh, Koske's talk and others, it's handy to be able to generate your jobs programmatically. Um, a lot of your jobs are going to look very, very similar. Um, Unless you've got a situation like builds.apache.org where you've got a hundred different completely independent projects that are doing their completely own things, you're probably going to have very similar jobs across the projects within your organization, and especially uh, for individual projects across multiple releases. So being able to automate the generation of those jobs and the updating of those jobs saves you a lot of manual labor. Um, I used to do this kind of thing with the REST API and the CLI to uh, post XML directly to Jenkins to create and update the jobs, but that was always kind of hackish. Uh, 
But now with a number of plugins that are around these days, you can define the whole job and workflows in a DSL or a similar kind of thing. Uh, some examples of that uh, are the job DSL plugin, um, which is my personal favorite in this space, which is a full groovy DSL for job definitions. So you can do loops uh, and iteration and uh, all kinds of combinations of real groovy code to be able to wrap around your, your, the DSL for actually generating the jobs. Um, it's got support for an immense number of plugins uh, built in and always adding more. Uh, it's a really handy, handy tool. Uh, the .ci plugin, which Koske mentioned, uh, is simpler uh, in terms of how you're defining your jobs, but it is more restricted to the specific way of doing things uh, that they do at Groupon. So it's a question between those two of uh, flexibility and power versus ease of use. Uh, the Literate plugin, which is in development and which there's actually a talk about going on right now, uh, lets you define your jobs uh, with a markdown-like syntax that you check into your uh, your, your Git repo. So it's similar to .ci, but with more flexibility uh, and a kind of not quite uh, human language, but you know, natural language, but something closer to that. Again, there's the questions of power versus uh, of power and flexibility versus ease of use, and so that's a trade-off that you have to decide yourself based on how complex your builds need to be. Uh, and how much power you want to give your users when they're setting up their jobs. <laughs> uh, next up is tending your plugin garden. Uh, do you really need that plugin? I mean, there are, as of uh, Sunday afternoon, uh, 945 plugins in the Update Center. That is a stupidly large number of plugins. There is no conceivable way that anybody's going to need all 945 of those plugins. Um, they duplicate each other a lot. There's like five or so different ones, at least, for uh, setting environment variables. Um, there are, well, three different ones I just mentioned for uh, job DSL kind of setup. Um, we haven't figured out how to do good plugin discovery and uh, deprecation of plugins and that sort of thing in the community. We need to work on that, but I've been saying that for two and a half years, and I haven't really done anything useful on that point, so we should assume it's not really going to get much better. So what I say, uh, what I recommend is don't install a plugin unless you're actually going to use it. Uh, every plugin you install adds a little bit of more overhead. It adds a little bit more potential confusion and problematic issues in terms of interaction between plugins. Um, and of course, there's always just bugs. Uh, given that there is a lot of duplication of functionality across plugins, you need to pick the right one for your use case. Don't install three different environment injecting plugins. S install one. Test them out in your testbed environment. See which one fits your use case and which one seems to do the best job at what you need it to do, and use that one. I mean, it may make sense to eventually move to a different one, but if so, migrate all your jobs to use the new plugin and get rid of the old one. <laughs> uh, like I said, plugins can cause some interesting in instability in areas you don't necessarily expect. Uh, they can add to the load and runtime for jobs. Uh, and yeah, I mean, why take a hit for something that you're not using? Uh, uh, clean up old plugins and their data. So after you've upgraded things, you may have sometimes gone to manage Jenkins and seen uh, comments about uh, a, th a thing pop up about uh, that you have old data or data in old format. Would you like to clean it up? That's what happens when a plugin or core changes how it's storing uh, configuration or build information. But it's being safe. Jenkins uh, is insanely ca uh, careful about backwards compatibility. So it hasn't actually deleted that data unless you tell it to. Uh, 
once you're sure that the new version of the plugin is the right one, you're not going to downgrade, et cetera, delete that old data. There's a button there for doing so. It will simplify your load time. It will decrease the size of your configuration files. It'll just get rid of cruft. Um, so I recommend that. And yeah, if you're not using a plugin, uninstall it. There's an uninstall button. Use it. Uh, it won't go away until the next time you restart Jenkins, but still, it's good to not have them if you're not going to use them. And again, like I said, uh, less plugins means faster load time for both the master and individual jobs. Uh, some essential plugins, again, just my personal opinion. I really, really love the job config history plugin. Um, it lets you keep track of the changes that have gone into your jobs and your general configuration of Jenkins and see diffs over time uh, and the like. That is immensely, immensely helpful. Just so you can see, okay, what happened? I know no code change between build uh, five and build six, so why did build six break? Oh, because somebody put a typo in the shell step. Um, it doesn't necessarily, it, it'll tell you who, uh, if they were logged in, who the user was who changed it. It doesn't integrate with uh, Git uh, directly, uh, but often it's good enough, not so much as a uh, backup and restore, but just to have that history, just to be able to visualize and understand how your jobs have changed. Um, though there are a couple caveats about the, that plugin that I'll mention later on. Uh, until recently, I strongly recommended the disk usage plugin to give you a, a sense of how much disk space each of your builds and your jobs were using so that you could know when you started running out of disk space, which job you needed to uh, purge builds from and which team you needed to yell at about how they were archiving their entire uh, build tree when they really, really didn't need to. But the latest version uh, of the latest versions have uh, a number of problems, in my opinion. They uh, don't work well with the lazy loading of builds. It's been around for the last year. They will scan the workspace uh, for and evaluate its disk usage at the end of every build, and they block the executor until that finishes, which with some builds can take a really long time. And while it seems like there's an ability to turn that off, there isn't actually an ability to turn that off. So it's a good example of why I'm conservative about my plugin upgrades is that you never know when you're going to end up getting bit by pretty drastic changes that result in a plugin not having the behavior that you expected. <laughs> uh, the static analysis plugin family are pretty simple and pretty useful. You can do check style, find bugs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's an extensible plugin that. Uh, the, the, for the, in the core of the plugin that uh, has 10 or so versions, I think, and it's easy to add more. Uh, the XUnit plugin is really, really handy if your tests are not outputting JUnit formatted XML by default. Um, so if you're not just using you know, Java builds, your tests could come out in all kinds of other formats. And Jenkins itself doesn't know anything about those formats. Sometimes there's a plugin that will handle those different formats directly in Jenkins, but then you're not getting uh, integration with Jenkins' ability to understand and report on tests directly. But the XUnit plugin can transform a large variety of different uh, test output formats into JUnit format, which then Jenkins can process on its own. So that's just a really simple transformation that can provide a lot of help. Uh, like I mention, mentioned, the parameterized trigger and conditional build step plugins are kind of my Swiss army knife for build workflows. They are really powerful. You can uh, block on uh, a downstream build you've kicked off. You can run that as a build step. Uh, you can, the, the, the number of different possible conditions for deciding whether to run a build step are pretty overwhelming. Uh, so again, like I said, they're not beginner-friendly, but they are insanely powerful. <coughs> the tool environment plugin is another really great plugin. Um, if you've used things like the ant step, the maven build step, 
Gradle build step, uh, those various uh, tools, they will automatically install the correct version of Java, Ant, Maven, Ruby, whatever the tool is, into uh, your slave for use in that build step. But what if you want to use that, but you don't want to use the specific tools build step? The tool environment plugin will uh, do the same installation process and then put the path to that tool into your environment so that you can use it from a shell build step. So it just makes things a little easier for a mishmash, a combination of different kinds of build steps. I think, think that the nvinjec plugin is currently the best option for setting environment variables in your build. But I know people who hate it. I know people who love it. It's both very powerful and sometimes terrifying. So there may be better choices for that, but I have generally personally done pretty well with the nvinjec plugin. It lets you either specify your environment variables directly uh, or using other environment variables or generate them via a groovy script. Uh, if you're using parameterized builds, there is no reason that you should not be using the rebuild plugin. Uh, if you've ever had to rebuild a parameterized build, you've discovered that you can't just rebuild it. You have to go cut and paste all the parameters to get them right. Uh, rebuild gives you a button that just rebuilds with the previous pr with the parameters that that build had used, which is very very useful. <laughs> and the build timeout plugin is, I think, kind of self-explanatory. Builds hang. That's not good. Uh, the build timeout plugin kills hung builds. Like I said, don't take my word for it uh, as gospel. These are what I feel are my essential plugins uh, based on my experience and my use cases. But you may not need any of these plugins. You may need completely different plugins. This is just some suggestions of ones that I've found to be pretty versatile, pretty useful, and generally pretty low risk. Don't forget to take a look at the global uh, Jenkins configuration when you've installed a new plugin. Uh, a lot of plugins will have global configuration, uh, and you don't always want to have the defaults. For example, uh, the job config history plugin, by default, will save a copy of uh, every single Maven module, if you're using the Maven job type, every time you make a change to the build. But nothing's actually changed in, each, in the individual Maven modules 99 times out of 100. So you end up with a lot of excess files that don't have any real purpose, that can gum up load times, uh, that can cause some history issues. It's, it's just generally kind of ugly. <coughs> so be careful about remembering to take a look at the global configuration and make sure that the plugins settings are right for your setup and right for your use case. Fifth habit is integrate with other tools and services. So Jenkins isn't on its own. It's not just sitting there and unable to talk to anything else. Thanks to its plugins and its REST API, other services and tools can easily interact with Jenkins and vice versa. You can do things like trigger builds based on GitHub build, uh, pull requests, update Jira upon successful builds, and a lot more. I'm only going to touch on a few of these tools and services. You can find many more on the Jenkins Wiki. Source control. Well, it kind of seemed like the most obvious integration with other services, but I'm assuming that we all know that you should be using source control and that Jenkins has source control plugins. So moving on. Uh, the Garrett Trigger plugin, uh, the GitHub pull request builder plugin, and my personal favorite, the Jenkins Enterprise version of uh, uh, GitHub pull request builder plugin are all very useful. They allow you to build every proposed change and report back to the review tool the results of, those, of that build. Uh, with this, you can enable uh, automatic merging of changes once they've been approved. 
uh, promotion from branch to branch, and a lot more. Uh, it's immensely useful to get to see whether a change actually works to some extent before it gets committed. Uh, for one thing, it takes away the excuse of breaking the build due to a compilation error forever. Uh, Jenkins integrates with Jira pretty well. It can update uh, Jira issues when uh, commits with uh, ma pattern matching messages are built and say, okay, this Jira was, uh, this issue was built, was checked in and built as of this build. You can follow build fingerprints to update issues in related projects in Jira as well. And one handy uh, feature is that it can uh, generate Jira release notes as part of your build process, uh, which can be handy when you're building your deliverables to actually have those release notes put into a useful form as, alongside your uh, binaries. Uh, Artifactory uh, is my personal favorite uh, uh, Maven repository manager, uh, and the Artifactory plugin for Jenkins is pretty great. <laughs> Let's you define your credentials for deployment, uh, and for artifact resolution, and your settings for artifact re resolution globally across all your Jenkins jobs, so you can override whatever setup in the POM or Ant or Gradle configuration. You can override the Maven distribution management on a per job basis. Um, you can restrict where certain jobs and build steps will look to resolve their artifacts. So you can make sure they're looking at a staging repository rather than your releases repository or something like that. And it can capture build information and uh, relationships between builds and their artifacts in Artifactory for reporting, auditing, and analysis. Habit six, make your slaves fungible. I really like the word fungible, so I'm using it here. So what does that mean? Uh, fungibility is the property of a good or commodity whose individual units are capable of multiple substitu mutual substitution. Basically, a fungible slave is a slave you can replace easily with another slave. Uh, if one slave dies or is busy, no big deal. Just add another slave that looks like that previous slave, and you're good to go. The easier it is for you to add slaves to your Jenkins instance, the easier your life is. The less jobs you have blocked, uh, the more configurations you can support, etc. <coughs> so how do you make your slaves fungible? The first step is to make creating your environment, the environments of your slaves, easily repeatable. You can do that with config management, Puppet, Chef, Ansible, you name it. You can do that with pre-baked images on uh, a cloud provider or Docker, or even on uh, physical hosts with something like PXE and Kickstart. Uh, I use a tool Packer uh, from the guy who wrote Vagrant uh, for, uh, along with some Puppet to generate my build slave images. Uh, and I can build them across multiple clouds, reuse them, et cetera. I don't have any opinion on which uh, config management tool you should use. Um, as far as I can tell, they're pretty much all good, and that's good enough. What matters is that you're using something that can let you set up your environment consistently. If you can't recreate a slave, it's going to be a problem, because eventually something will go wrong in that slave, and you're going to really wish you had an easy way to rebuild it. Reusability and flexibility of your slaves is important. Try to make your slaves general purpose. Uh, if you can, don't make them customized solely for use by one job or one subset of your jobs. If your slaves are interchangeable and can be used for more than uh, a small portion of your jobs, you're going to be using them more efficiently. You will have less downtime uh, in which you have a slave sitting around idle while 10 other jobs are waiting for a more generalized slave to be available. But you're going to sometimes need specific custom environments, like if you have to support uh, tests on six different platforms or something like that. In those cases, if you can, uh, don't tie up static resources with those slaves. Make them on demand uh, with uh, various cloud plugins so that you're, only, you're, you're not uh, 
Sorry, brain fart. You're not tying up your resources with idle slaves. Uh, you're bursting out and getting that capacity when you need it, but not when you don't need it. Speaking of that, the cloud. Uh, dynamic provisioning of slaves is incredibly, incredibly useful. Uh, it's a much more efficient way to use your resources than just having all your slaves be on all the time on dedicated resources. Uh, there's a whole, it doesn't matter whether you're doing this on private cloud or public cloud. The goal is to avoid those idle resources. Uh, besides EC2 plugin, JCloud's plugin, VMware plugin, etc., one thing that I've found intriguing is a Mesos plugin with Docker. It lets you run your slaves as containers in a general purpose cluster that could be doing other things as well. Uh, and definitely with your cloud slave images, you want to pre-bake them. You want to build in what you need uh, and, re and boot straight from that rather than having to run Puppet or Chef when you spin up your slave and wait 10 minutes for it to install the software you need. Faster startup times means that you get your slaves faster, you're spending less money on them, uh, and it means that you've got that guarantee of, a con guarantee of a consistent environment, so you've got repeatable builds. The seventh and final habit is to join the community. There's a whole ton of ways to do this. You can write plugins, uh, you can open JIRAs. That's an easy one. We all hit bugs. Open a JIRA for it. And of course, the best thing you can do there is fix the bugs, but not everybody has the time, interest, knowledge, or inclination to do that. If you need help, get on the mailing lists or on the IRC channel. Uh, and while you're there, you can help others out. Uh, and you're all obviously part of the community already, or you wouldn't be here, but Anything you can do to help out the rest of the community ends up helping yourself eventually, too. Uh, like I said, the full version of this uh, slide deck that's on uh, SlideShare has six additional slides full of links uh, to all of the plugins that I've mentioned. Um, but I didn't want to clutter uh, all of your times with uh, that right here. Uh, so uh, we got a couple minutes. Any questions?